Hi, this is John Rennie, and my presentation is the future of the interstate highway system, a land use perspective. I'm sorry I cannot join you in person. I uh, had to evacuate for Hurricane Irma, and I am now uh, waiting out the word to return back home uh, to South Florida. Um, uh, in New Orleans and um, just was not possible to be able to get over to Austin. So um, I hope you're able to watch this presentation. Um, and um, again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but um, hopefully able to convey this information through some technology. I am the director of the Center for Urban Environmental Solutions at Florida Atlantic University, uh, located in Boca Raton. I serve as an honorary research associate at Oxford University in the Transport Studies Unit. I chair the Transportation Research Board, Transportation and Land Development Committee, ADD30. Um, and um, I'm going to share with you some perspectives on the future of the interstate system looking at land use perspective. Uh, I wrote an article uh, last year that was published in the Journal of Urban History Call is a review essay of these three books, um, Interstate, uh, Highway Politics, 1939, Changing Lanes, and Car Country. And the review essay of these three books I titled The Road Becoming Less Traveled, The History of Highways in America. And in the history of the interstate highway system, it's very much intertwined with the development of real estate in the United States. So whatever we think about the future of the interstate highway system, we it would be a mistake for us not to think about the future development patterns that we want to encourage in the United States over the next century. And so what I've done here is um, I, I go want to go back a little bit to the foundations of the interstate highway system. Toll roads and free roads was a report uh, to Congress in 1939, and then um, it was kind of built upon by interregional highways in 1944. And this is when we were setting the policy of what the interstate highway system would become. Um, of course, the, um, the uh, Highway Act, um, signed by Eisenhower, uh, cemented all of these policies into a legislation and funding that would implement a lot of these policies. And when we look at the history of the interstate highway system, we often think that it started in the 19. 50s, but really the grounds for the policy were laid many decades, several decades before that. Of course, you know, World War II, I think, delayed things for a little while. But as you can see, even in 1944, uh, we were still thinking about the, the highway system and the function that it would play. So we have a moment now here where your committee is going to write yet another report to Congress. And that report may not be implemented next year. It may not be implemented in five years from now. It may not be implemented for 10 or 15 years from now, but it's important. And the findings that you put forth as recommendations could have an impact on the future of our country, um, even if, you know, Congress in 10 or 20 years from now picks up on that and decides to implement that, uh, the work that you're doing is very important in laying the groundwork for the future of our country, both from a transportation perspective and ultimately from a development perspective. So what I've tried to do here is to categorize the transportation trends and the land use trends going back um, you know, by decades and then looking forward into the future. So the 1930s and 1940s, from a transportation perspective, we saw that transit dominated travel. The auto industry was certainly growing and the federal government was planning for highways. Um, from the land use perspective, most of our population concentrated in large cities. In the 1950s and 60s, 
that was an era of, of virtually unobstructed highway building. And we saw the beginnings of American suburbanization at that point. In the 70s and 80s, we saw environmental and community resistance movements um, changes the highway approval process. It's, it slowed highway building down. It made it much more cumbersome. Uh, the NEPA and um, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, these sorts of federal policies um, really slowed down the highway building in terms of what it had been in the 50s and 60s. Now, of course, we still did a lot of highway building. Um, it didn't necessarily change the outcome at the end of the day. We still ended up with a very large, robust highway system, but the process had to incorporate a much larger component of environmental community input, slowed down the building process. We also saw a massive suburbanization of America in the 70s and 80s. In the 1990s until 2007, I put 2007 as the break point, um, you know, kind of because that's leading up to the Great Recession. So during that period, uh, highway building slowed. We pretty much built out the interstate system in the United States. Um, traffic congestion certainly mounts uh, and takes over. If you look at the um, Texas Transportation Institute's uh, reports, you can see uh, there are urban mobility reports how, you know, uh, traffic congestion just really grows exponentially, um, you know, during that time period. And ICE-T was passed and subsequently T21 and, 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 and um, Safety Lou and, uh, you know, subsequent T legislations. The, they created a new multimodal policy framework uh, from a transportation perspective in the United States. We could begin to flex highway dollars into transit projects. We started putting more money into building uh, non-motorized facilities. But yet at the same time, we still saw a massive suburbanization of America. Uh, just because the transportation policy framework was shifting to become more multimodal, we didn't necessarily see that on the land use trends. The land use trends was just the same continuous um, status quo that we saw in the 70s and 80s, which was the continued suburbanization of America. But in 2007, 2012, we experienced the Great Recession. We also saw during that time period peak VMT travel and the Highway Trust Fund going broke. Um, I'll come back to that in, in uh, the next slide. But the Great Recession really, I think, has begun to change the landscape of America because we saw minimal home building during this time. Now, coming out of the Great Recession from 2012 to now, um, and, and I'm going to stay on the land use side for a moment, we saw that millennials and, and even uh, baby boomers are embracing central city locations, walkable suburbs, and transient development. So I'm going to pick up on that in another slide as well. On the transportation side, we're starting to see some pretty significant revolutions in the 2012-2017 uh, period, which is the advent of network transportation companies, which you know may not have revolutionized yet the actual percentage of all trips being taken, but it's laying the groundwork and the framework for what we're going to see happen in the future. Um, and it is probably one of the most innovative things, most disruptive technologies that's hit transportation um, in many, many generations. But it, we also are seeing the growing popularity of walking, biking, and rail systems, light rail systems. I mean, Denver is, is building out a massive rail system. Uh, we're seeing other light rail systems being built and proposed. In South Florida, we're seeing the first privately financed rail system being built. It should open uh, any month now, the Bright Line. So we're starting to see a lot more innovations and changes happening in the transportation sector, more private sector involvement. Um, oh, I, I didn't include it in here, but the dawn of, uh, of bike sharing um, has, has pretty much you know spread out all over the country. Every city 
Um, you know, every most major cities now have bike sharing systems. So we are seeing some some really innovative things happening in the transportation sector post recession uh, that we haven't really seen in many decades in the United States. Um, so you know, carpooling, for example, in the '70s and '80s, there was a lot of money put into carpooling programs by government agencies, and it never took off. But all of a sudden, with the advent of Uber and Lyft, people are voluntarily carpooling, um, and no one would have necessarily thought that would have ever happened if you, you know, go back, you know, back into the '90s or '80s, um, or even the 2000s for that matter. So, what's the future going to become? While well, looking at my crystal ball, um, I think we're going to see the dawn of the autonomous vehicle era. There's been a lot of attention and talk about that. Um, and I think we're also going to see the need for transportation finance reforms at federal and state levels. Um, and I apologize, um, it's increased, this could uh, lead to an increased reliance on user fees. That's what I uh, meant to put in this box. Um, so as we see uh, these these gas tax not generating enough revenues to pay for the transportation system. Um, you know, there's been lots of talk over the years about increasing reliance on user fees. These could be probably tolls is 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 going to be the easiest way to implement that. Um, you know, but of course, VMT taxes, and now you know what people using Uber and Lyft, um, you actually can maybe even tax that uh, in, in some way. But I think we're going to need to find a way to do that. Um, on the land use side, um, trends are pointing to more renters, smaller homes, and preferences for more walkable and bikeable neighborhoods. Um, this is when you you know when you look at the um, uh, the, the, the information come in National Association of Realtors and other studies that have been done, you know, we, we see that, you know, it's getting more and more expensive to buy homes, even though interest rates have been relatively low, uh, we're still not seeing kind of the, the adoption of home ownership amongst the younger generation as we've seen in the past. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, people are more transient, they, they move more often, they're going for the, the you know, the better jobs. Uh, but I think a big part of it is that they want to live in more urban central city locations or transit development locations. They simply can't afford to buy in those locations, but they can't afford to rent in those locations. And also an important factor too, if you think about it, is the amount of debt that the average American has upon graduating from college. The debt is so high already that younger people are just not wanting to take on additional debt through a mortgage because they already have, in some cases, well over 100000 or more in, in student loan debt. And, um, you know, they've already, in essence, kind of mortgaged their futures through their education, and therefore renting provides an, an, a lower uh, risk financial decision for them. Um, so let's take a moment and talk about the highway trust fund uh, going broke. Here we see the trends. Um, you can see the green line represents the end of the year balance, and it shows that. Um, and, and again, this this um, slide was produced in 2015, so it's a couple years old. But we see that the trust fund going broke. Now it's important to realize is this is not just at the federal level, every state highway trust fund is experiencing very similar trends. So, you know, this is not just one issue at the federal level. This is, you know, 50, 51 issues, you know, or 52 issues, uh, you know, for every state and, and uh, you know, District of Columbia and, and I'm sure, um, you know, Puerto Rico, I know, is having some financial troubles as well. Uh, notwithstanding Hurricane Irma, which devastated the, the island. Um, but we see here that on the, the dark blue line that um, our actual outlays and our projected outlays are, are growing. So the disparity between the amount of money we need and the amount of money that we have has, has resulted in transfers from the general fund. And so that started in 2008, and, and it happened 2008, 9, and 10, and then again a little bit in 2012 and 13, but a significant transfer of uh, funds from the general fund 
to uh, basically plug the gaps of the highway trust fund in 2014. So I think that that at some point the Congress is going to get to a a situation where they're not going to want to continue to subsidize the highway trust fund. And they're going to say, okay, we need to completely um, rethink this. And and of course, we all know the reasons for this. And we, we don't we don't index uh, the gasoline tax to inflation, so we lose money each year. Um, there has been very little little political will to actually raise the gas tax or do something about this. There's been virtually no political will to, to implement a VMT tax, uh, vehicle miles travel tax. But we shouldn't overcome this po- public policy challenge without thinking about land use. This is a new index uh, that I created Uh, called the TOD index, stands for Transit Oriented Development. And you could see that by going back, um, this looks at over a thousand Transit Oriented Development locations. Uh, Transit Oriented Developments are areas within a half a mile of a train station. And in this case, they're defined as places that have a walk score of 70 or greater and a gross housing density of eight units to the acre, which is 4,000 housing units within the half mile catchment area, which is quite dense. Um, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, uh, about uh, 1200 or so train station areas in the United States meet this definition and in regions all over the United States. It's not just the dense regions in the Northeast. This is, you know, all over the country places have TODs. And in the home values in the TODs grew significantly up to the peak um, compared to the national average. And then, of course, it dipped a little bit. But what I want to focus on is the recovery. So from about, uh, you know, December, January 2012 to, to the present, you could see home values in transit developments are growing at a much higher rate than the market as a whole. And here you can see the rental rates. Uh, this goes back to December 2010 the rental rates have grown 33.8% in transit development locations compared to 6.6% for the national average. And so this, what this represents is just the increased desirability of the general population to live in, live or buy homes or rent uh, apartments in transit-oriented development locations. And that's because the demand is very high and the supply is very limited. Uh, I think only about four and a half percent of all homes in the United States are within a half a mile of one of our 4,500 or so train stations in the United States. Um, and, and actually 4,500 includes train, BRT, and ferry terminals. Uh, BRT and ferry terminals each represent about 5% of the supply, so about 90% are train stations. So the the supply is very limited and the demand is very high, so the price goes up. So any transportation policies of the future need to think about our our, our real estate policies and are we incentivizing or encouraging the development of new housing in connection to our transportation system. And we've not done that very well in the United States in the past, but there have certainly been efforts to try and do that. And so um, what I want to do by cl- closing here, I, I saw this recently, it was published on August 24th, 2017, um, just a couple weeks ago, by the Congress for New Urbanism, and they talk about rethinking the future of state DOTs. And I thought this did a good job of capturing uh, the essence of what I'm trying to summarize, looking historically at the trends in transportation and land use, and then projecting into the future of what Congress should recommend uh, or what TRB should recommend to Congress for the future of the highway transportation system. And, And here's what they say. They say, number one, the future DOT should focus on building communities through transportation instead of transportation through communities. And again, this is focused not just at the U.S. DOT, but at all state DOTs as well. Number two, there needs to be an overhaul of the planning program and 
and frameworks behind current transportation project delivery. Number three, DOTs will need to accept the responsibility for active transportation, namely walking and biking, on all levels of the road and street system. A lot of times the DOTs will only get involved for state routes, uh, but it's important to create a network of walking and biking uh, where people are safe. We have a very significant safety issue in the United States, and Florida is one of the leaders in uh, traffic uh, fatalities, unfortunately. And, you know, FDOT is starting to do a better job at addressing this, but we have a long way to go. Number four, make DOTs a center for statewide planning. Number five, share real decision-making responsibilities with communities. And number six, make placemaking central to transportation decisions. So this, I think these are, are excellent spot-on recommendations that we need to really seriously consider when thinking about the future of the interstate system and the role for DOTs and how they could bring together transportation and land use policies. So with that, I just want to say thank you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, here's my email address. And if you want more information on the TOD Index, you can go to the website, which is www.todindex.com. And um, I wish you luck in putting your report together. And I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you very much.